So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Medical Board of California Panel A meeting. Pursuant to the provision of Governor Gavin Newsom's Executive Order N29-20, dated March 17th, 2020, this meeting is being conducted via WebEx. If you're having difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting, it could be because the device you're connecting with has bandwidth limitations. If you have any difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting using your device, please click the ellipsis button at the bottom of the WebEx application or the audio and video menu item at the top of the WebEx application and then select switch audio. You'll see an option to call in and will be provided with a telephone number, access code, and attendee ID that can be used to connect to the meeting via phone. Using the information provided, it will automatically disconnect your device's audio and connect your phone to the name you joined the meeting with. By using this method, if you are having audio problems with your device, this will still allow you to participate and hear the audio of the board meeting. We see the instructions on how to connect link at the last page of the meeting agenda for step-by-step -step WebEx instructions, including screenshots. Thank you, Ms. Lubiano. You can now start the meeting. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Lori Rose Lubiano, Chair of Panel A. Today, just as last time, we have quite the agenda. We have uh, two oral arguments and uh, a bunch of deliberations that we will have to do in closed session. So we'll be going in and out between open and closed session. I'd like to now call the meeting to order and let's please start with a roll call. Dr. Ganadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Mr. Rue? Present. Mr. Watkins? Present. Dr. Yip? Here. Ms. Lubiano? Morning. Morning. Ms. Lubiano? Here. We have a quorum. Here. Thank you. Moving to item number. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Yip, did you have something to say? I just say hello, everybody. Great, thank you. Moving to item two is our first oral argument. I would now like to turn it over to our administrative law judge, Judge Brown. Thank you, Ms. Lubiano, and good morning to everyone. My name is Danette Brown, and I am your administrative law judge this morning. Uh, does, does the board uh, have a preference about which case goes first, uh, either Dr. DeWar or Dr. Hunt, or is there a set agenda for which case goes first? Uh, we have Dr. DeWar first on our okay. agenda. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, before we get on the record, I just want to confirm that the parties are here. Judge Brown, I'm, I'm going through my list here and going to promote them to the uh, speaking positions. Just give me just one second. I apologize. Terrific. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez, are you there? Doesn't look like you're connected by audio and I do not see Mr. Lincoln on yet. Your Honor, uh, this is Shelly Coffey, your court reporter. Yes, Ms. Coffey, can I get your CSR number, please? Yes. Uh, are you ready? Yes, ma'am. 6808. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, can I just, um, re re I need a little bit of information here. I know you you have me here because you want a written record. If someone is speaking so that I cannot understand them, I'm going to need to interrupt. Do you want me to do that? Yes, please. And that way um, we all know that the parties are either speaking too fast, too, too um, silently. So, um, yeah, speak up and let them know that they need to either speak up or speak slowly or whatever okay. the case is. Okay, great. I will be doing that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello, Your Honor. This is Alexander Alvarez, uh, Supervising Deputy Attorney General. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Oh, yes. great. Um, Robbie, or Robert Lincoln, the DAG who is assigned to this matter, is trying to log on right now. He's having some technical difficulties. I'm trying to trying to assist him. 
Pardon me. Sorry, sorry, the dog. So I'm I'm gonna mute myself and I'm gonna try to assist them. Oh, you're in. This is Shelly Coffee again. You mentioned earlier before we go on the record. We're not on the record yet. We are not on the record yet. Okay, I will wait for your instruction. Great. Thank you, Ms. Coffee. I have uh, Ms. Ermer. See if I'm hopefully pronouncing that right. Ms. Ermer, are you there? Had her listed on the respondent attorney. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Yes, we are here. This is Ms. Ermer. Is everyone, is your respondent and, and the um, other attorney name listed here with you? Is it, Are all you together, I guess is what I'm asking? Yes, Nicole Ermer here and sitting to my right is Dr. Dewar and off camera is my associate, Kimberly Elkin. Great. Thank you. I won't look for any more names on that side then. Uh, just looking for Mr. Lincoln here. Okay. Sorry, Ms. Alvarez, did you say something there? Yes, I'm sorry. Is there is he able to call in? Is could you provide him a number? For some reason, um, the registration link is not allowing them, allowing them to join. Is there a I, phone number? I think he's trying to join the wrong meeting. I just sent him the link in a direct email. Could you ask him to click on that link in that email? It should take him right in. Okay, I will um, call him right back. Sorry, apologize for this. Hold on. Robbie.
Hello. I think he's having um, difficulties. Unless you can give him a phone number to call into, I guess I will argue it. Hello, Sean, can you hear me? Sorry about that. I'm on, on the phone with Mr. Lincoln right now and trying to get him in the oh. meeting. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you so much. Excuse me. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and try to have Mr. Lincoln call in. Thank you for your patience here. Give me just a few moments. Okay, Mr. Lincoln, you should be able to hit star six on your phone to unmute your microphone there. Hello, this is Dag Robert Lincoln. Can you all hear me? We can. Thank you very much. Okay, Judge Brown, I'll turn it back over to you now. We have uh, representatives from the Department of Justice and from the respondent side. Great. Thank you, Mr. Eichelkraut, and good morning to everyone. Let's go ahead and get on the record here. Madam court reporter all set. Yes, thank you. Your honor. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call the case. Then. We are on the record before the medical board of California in the matter of the accusation against Christopher Michael DeWar MD. This is medical board case number 800-2019-0. 19929 and OAH number 20220104446. Today is February 9th, 2022, and the time is approximately 9:20 a.m. and this hearing is being conducted by video conference. This is the date, time and place set for oral argument in the notice of hearing for oral argument. My name is Danette Brown, and I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings assigned to hear this matter. Prior to going on the record, the board members identified themselves and a quorum was established. May I take the appearance of counsel first starting with the Deputy Attorney General, please. Excuse me, do we have a yes. roll call? Hi, this is Robert Lincoln, Deputy Attorney General, on behalf of complainant, the Medical Board of California. Good morning to you, Mr. Lincoln. And for the respondent. Good morning, Your Honor. Nicole Ermer, on behalf of Dr. Dewar, who's sitting to my right. Also present, as I mentioned earlier off camera, is Kimberly Elkin, who's an associate with my office. Great. Thank you, Ms. Irma, and good morning to you, Dr. Dewar. The board has, in this matter, issued an order of non-adoption of a proposed decision by an administrative law judge 
and has determined to decide the matter itself. The board has invited particular discussion of whether the proposed order should be modified. The following process and time limitations will apply. Respondent will have 15 minutes to make an opening argument. The Deputy Attorney General will then have 15 minutes for a response. Respondent then will have five minutes for closing argument. And the Deputy Attorney General will have five minutes for closing argument. Time limits will be strictly enforced. The arguments will be based or shall be based only on the existing record and shall not exceed the scope of the record of duly admitted evidence. No new evidence will be heard. The panel members may ask questions of the parties to clarify arguments, but may not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. The administrative law judge and any panel member may ask a party to support the party's oral argument on a matter with a specific citation to the record. At the end of the oral arguments by counsel, I will offer respondent an opportunity to address the panel regarding the penalty. If respondent elects to address the panel, I will first place him under oath. After oral argument, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. The parties will not receive a decision today, but will be receiving one in the mail sometime in the future. Kindly remember that all arguments must be based on the existing record and no new evidence will be heard. And that the board has already had the benefit of reading your briefs. With that, we will commence with the arguments. First, starting with respondent, please. Good morning, Your Honor, and good morning, panel A. It's a pleasure to meet everybody. I do anticipate Dr. Dewar addressing the, uh, the panel at the end of the five minutes or the allotted time of my five minutes. So I understand the inquiry today is to be whether is an LPR discipline order sufficient to protect the public when considering a single DUI with a 0.16 BAC, an accident, and injury. But I implore the panel not to stop with the inquiry there. I believe the panel should go deeper. And the relevant question here today is, has there been sufficient education and rehabilitation of Dr. Dewar to protect the public in the future? This DUI occurred three years ago in 2018. Dr. Dewar has done everything in his power that's possible since 2018 to address the issue, self-reflection, and determine whether or not he had an issue. This case has not only been evaluated by Dr. Dewar in the last three years. In the last three years, this case has intimately, personally been touched by the wellness community at the ER uh, department that he works at in Lowe. It has been evaluated by his colleagues and supervisors. It has been evaluated by the Superior Court when granting early termination of probation, as well as his rehabilitation when offering a 1203.4, the dismissal of the criminal matter. This matter has been touched and evaluated and probed by Dr. Clark Smith, a board certified psychiatrist a board certified forensic specialist, as well as a board certified addiction specialist. This matter has been in a day hearing evaluated by administrative law judge Mazuseki. I'd like to turn our attention in the order that Judge Mazuseki, and I apologize for skewing the name, but she evaluated not only Dr. Dewar, sincerity and credibility, she evaluated Dr. Smith's credibility, credentials, and opinion. She evaluated Dr. Satari, who testified. The remaining letters were introduced not as administrative hearsay, but they were introduced as direct evidence under 11514. And that can be found at the, the hearing transcript at page 48, line through 3 through 16. 
So all those letters have been admitted as evidence and not as hearsay evidence. And after weighing this evidence, she found that there was sufficient rehabilitation and that public protection is satisfied with an LPR. And this discipline order is acceptable to Dr. Dewar. When she evaluated Dr. Dewar, who took the stand and who was forthright and forthcoming, she found that he was polite, contrite, straightforward, and consistent. Page 7, paragraph 11 of the transcript. He expressed seer sincere remorse for his actions and had numerous steps to demonstrate to never occur again. And we'll go over those steps in a minute. His commitment to sobriety was palpable and numerous things he has done to demonstrate change behavior was powerful. A very credible witness and you will meet Dr. Dewar in this discussion today. Dr. Dewar is an ER physician. He works at Enlo Medical Center. He's board certified. He's in good standing. He made partner unanimously in 2020 with the knowledge of the conviction as well as his ongoing medical board proceedings. He has the support and the, the support of his colleagues, supervisors, and staff. In the last two years, Dr. Dewar has been on the front lines in the emergency room in the COVID pod. He's been protecting the public, his patients, as well as his colleagues who are of an age that would be dangerous for them to be handling patients of that. He's put himself on the front lines. Dr. Dewar's transparency is, mit is significant mitigation. He disclosed his arrest back in 2018 to his employers immediately. They advised him to go meet with the wellness community who evaluated him. And Dr. O'Regan said was clear that after reviewing not only the arrest records, doing interviews in the ER, talking with staff who know him, it was clear to continue practice and determined further evaluation and treatment germane to alcohol abuse was unnecessary. Dr. Reagan acknowledged that the, his actions were serious, but there was no clinical problems or concerns with his patient care. Dr. Dewar was open and transparent with his employers and colleagues. Dr. Whitman stated that he's an outstanding ER physician. And after Dr. Dewar disclosed to him and reviewing details and actual documents, we, I determined this was an aberration and not a reoccurring problem. Dr. Whitman's the medical director at Enlo Emergency Department and his statement can be found at Exhibit E. Dr. Perham, who's his senior supervising uh, physician, found, finds Dr. Dewar considerate and provides patient-centered care. He admitted that this was not easy for Dr. Dewar to go to a senior partner, look him in the eye, and say, I messed up. But he said he took responsibility and action for it, and he was sincere when doing so. He owned the situation. Dr. Satari not only testified, but he also wrote a letter. And, Dr. and Judge Metasuki found that he was credible, straightforward, and consistent. He said that Dr. Dewar was forthright and remorseful when he told him that he made a mistake and he got a DUI and that he did everything that he could do to make correct the wrong. Dr. Cesari said that Dr. Dewar got it. He gets it. He understands it was a mistake. Now, this event was three years ago. It was an isolated incident. Dr. Dewar has been transparent with the interview of, with the uh, DCA. He's been transparent with the courts. He's been transparent with his colleagues. He's not tried to hide it. He has owned his mistake and has tried to do everything in the last three years to correct it. And I think that's important to outline here for, the, for this panel. He's abstained from alcohol since 2018. He has uh, participated in PBI, which is the court order program that Mr. Lincoln is advising this panel to have Dr. Do. Not, not only did he complete 22 hours of the ethics PBI program, he enrolled and participated in the maintenance and accountability, which is beyond what is being requested of him here today. And all of that can also be found in the record uh, at exhibit K and L. And he also received a 1203.4. Importantly as well, he was evaluated by Dr. Smith, 
Dr. Clark Smith, as I mentioned, has more than 30 years of, of experience in forensic psychiatry as well as addiction. He's found that Dr. Dewar has no substance abuse diagnosis. He did not require additional treatment or toxicology. And this also rebuts the presumption that under uniform standards and sub substance abuse. He found that Dr. Dewar has no psychological or addiction issues that would make him necessary, would make him a threat to the public or any ongoing treatment that's necessary that he hasn't already participated within the last three years. Dr. Dewar is an excellent ER physician. He's acknowledged the mistake he's made and the issues. He's probably more self-critical than the board can be to him today. He appreciates the risk and he appreciates that he has threatened the trust of his licensing board, the trust of his colleagues, and the trust of his patients as the, and the public. He can't go back and change time of that fateful day on December 2018. <clears throat> But he has used time to his favor. The last three years, he has been evaluated in numerous forums. He has participated in numerous programs to ensure that this is an isolated incident. He's remorseful. He's been rehabilitated. And we respect that an LPR is sufficient to protect the public. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eimer. Now we will have 15 minutes for a response by Deputy Attorney General Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln, are you there? Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor, and members of the board. Thank you for having me today and listening to my arguments on this matter. This is not a typical DUI arrest case. The facts in this case show reckless and injurious behavior from a physician who knows better. Respondent was arrested by the California Highway Patrol on December 18, 2018, after two vehicle collision in Kusala County, California. When the CHP officer observed respondent to be intoxicated, the officer began to administer a preliminary alcohol screen, a PAS, on respondent. During the screen, the officer informed respondent that in order for him to take an accurate breath test, respondent would need to refrain from spitting, burping, or vomiting. Respondent proceeded to burp two different times while the CHP officer was attempting to retrieve an accurate breath test, knowing he was supposed to not do so. However, the CHP officer was still able to get a breath test sample from respondent. Respondent had a blood alcohol level of 0.161%, twice the legal limit. Additionally, when searching respondent's vehicle, after being placed under arrest, the officer observed a backpack in respondent's vehicle, which smelled of alcohol and contained three mostly drunken bottles with alcohol in them. Finally, even though the other driver at the time of the accident fled the scene, CHP officers were later able to get in contact with him and discovered that as a result of the collision, the other driver sustained major injuries consisting of four fractured ribs. Given these facts, if the board were to adopt this extremely lenient position, it would be contrary to the board's disciplinary guidelines and contrary to the board's paramount interest of protection of the public and respondents rehabilitation. Being licensed is a privilege when respondent drove drunk and was involved in a vehicle collision, he abused that privilege. You've heard already this morning about respondent's rehabilitation. However, this has little to do regarding the board's job of imposition of discipline. What is relevant are the facts of this case. 
Keep that in mind as you form the legal framework for determining the imposition of discipline, including the length of terms of probation. The proposed penalty is inadequate. It must be modified. Judge Matuszewski deviated significantly from the guidelines. While it's laudable for respondents to take responsibility for his actions, it does not justify the deviation from the board's disciplinary guidelines. And therefore, her recommendation of a public reprimand should not be adopted. The disciplinary guidelines call for a minimum penalty of state revocation, five years probation, a maximum penalty of revocation, and uniform standard terms of abstain from use of alcohol and controlled substances, biological fluid testing, participation in a professionalism program or ethics course, psychiatric evaluation, and psychotherapy. Additional probation and terms beyond a public reprimand are necessary and appropriate to adequately protect the public and aid in respondent's rehabilitation. As a result, we propose that respondent's license is revoked and stayed for three years probation. The terms of biological fluid testing are imposed that he abstain from the use of alcohol and controlled substances complete a professionalism program and undergo a psychiatric evaluation and psychotherapy. Per the, per the board's disciplinary guidelines, any proposed decision or settlement that departs from the disciplinary guidelines shall identify the departures and the facts supporting the departure. During the hearing, Dr. Clark Smith's recommendation that respondent was not a substance abuse licensee and respondent's own credibility while testifying and his remorse during cross-examination were reasons that I believe during a hearing we could slightly deviate from the board's disciplinary guidelines and propose a three-year term of probation instead of five. While I erred in not recommending biological fluid testing during the hearing, I fully reincorporate that term here today in the probation terms because of its importance in the board's protection of the public. It is our opinion that Dr. Clark Smith had not observed respondent long enough to have a strong enough basis that respondent was not a substance abusing licensee, and the ALJ erred in weighing this opinion so heavily to merit the significant deviation from the disciplinary guidelines by recommending a public reprimand in this matter. With that said, I submit my argument here today as well as my written argument. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Now, respondent will have five minutes for closing argument. Your Honor, at, at this point, I the last two minutes I do want to allocate for uh, from Dr. Dewar to make a statement. Would you just like me to stop at three minutes or? Yes, you can stop at three minutes and then um, I know that uh, Dr. Dewar will be testifying, but perhaps I can uh, place him under oath at this time. Sure. Would you like Dr. Dewar, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, sir? Yes, I do. Thank you, Dr. Dewar. All right, Ms. Ermer, uh, yeah, if you could kindly just stop at three minutes and then you can hand it over to your client. Very good. Contrary to what the DAG has indicated, the De Deputy Attorney General, the rule here of Panel A is not to penalize or discipline Dr. Dewar, but it's to ensure that public safety is protected. The Attorney General's failed to outline as why additional terms that Dr. Dewar's already successfully completed and sanctioned by the board are needed to duplicate to protect public safety. The disciplinary guidelines adequately put on page two that there is grounds to deviate from the standard out outline as presented by Doc, uh, excuse me, Mr. Lincoln. And that deviation is based upon the rehabilitation and the efforts of the licensee. 
Here, there's been a significant amount of mitigation and rehabilitation provided for panel A to consider. Again, this case has been evaluated on a personal level, not only by Dr. Smith, but by the wellness committee at NLO, his colleagues, his physicians, his supervisors. People have evaluated Dr. Dewar and have found his sincerity to his sobriety and his mitigation. The panel should not underestimate the deterrent of the process of this last three years. This last year has been a significant emotional impact to Dr. Dewar. There's not only the shame of telling your colleagues, the time commitment to the court probation programs, whether it's the DUI program, and although that is part of a probationary term, for a young doctor and physician who actively has a lifestyle, the commitment to going to these programs and learning is beneficial, but it can also serve as a deterrent. And that's what the Superior Court has, why they order these programs. Not only the loss of his driver's license is a deterrent, the education and the course time that he's learned and he has learned not to repeat this behavior, and these MDC proceedings cannot be taken lightly and underestimate the stress that it is to be evaluated on many different levels. You're interviewing at the investigation level, the hearing at the uh, level with the OOH, and then being presented in front of the panel here today puts a lot of stress and emotion on these licensees. And that does serve as a deterrent for somebody who has simply made a mistake. There's no evidence that he has repeat behaviors in addiction issues, uh, which would be a concern for the board. But there's nothing on this record that shows that this is an ongoing prevalent substance abuse problem. Dr. Dewar has done everything in his power. He loves being an ER doctor. He's been on the front lines. He understands it's a pr privilege to be a doctor. And he understands how his mistake has put that in jeopardy. And that in itself is a significant deterrent to ensure this doesn't happen again and to protect public safety. Now I turn it over to Dr. Dewar. Morning, everybody. Um, I wanna thank the board for providing me with another opportunity to apologize for my conduct uh, back in 2018. Uh, my actions that night went completely against my moral code uh, and I assure everyone that nothing like this will ever happen again. I'm sorry for my behavior and I appreciate the medical board's commitment to public safety. I recognize that my behavior that night was immature, selfish, and reckless. I understand that because of my actions, there will be a permanent mark on my medical license. Given the opportunity to continue to practice, I will make sure that this it never happens again. I spent a significant amount of time uh, since this incident to self-reflect and to improve. On that night, my behaviors are wrong. I offer no excuse because there is no excuse. Uh, dealing with the consequences of my actions has made me healthier and stronger. I'm more introspective and better equipped to take excellent care of my patients. It's also made me more empathetic, which I think we all can agree is a necessary quality for all great ER doctors. I entered the field of medicine because I wanted to help people. With the pandemic, my commitment has been solidly reaffirmed. Treating sick COVID patients, staying current with the ever-changing medications and protocols, dealing with the strains on my hospital and my fellow healthcare workers has been both extremely challenging and rewarding. I know that what I do each and every day makes a difference in my patient's lives, whether it's in the resuscitation of a critical patient or taking an extra moment to encourage a reluctant patient to get vaccinated during their discharge instructions. Being an emergency doctor is the single most important part of my life, and I've worked to fulfill this dream for over half of my life. I would like to continue to grow in my career as an emergency physician, but understand that there's a real possibility that I'll lose my job due to insurance companies removing me from their payers panel if I were to be put on probation. I pray that the board will accept the judge's recommendation for an LPR so that I can continue with my employment at Illo Hospital and can continue to use my training, skills, and compassion to benefit my life's work. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Eimer and Dr. Dewar. And lastly, the Deputy Attorney General will have five minutes for closing argument. Mr. Lincoln? Hello. Part of the board's role here is protecting the public and irrespective of what respondent has completed as part of his criminal probation from his criminal conviction, the board through its disciplinary guidelines 
has the additional layer of public protection, the board conducts its own evaluation of licensee with its own conditions and rules to ensure the licensee is not substance abusing and ensures protection of the public. Respondent here was arrested in December 2018 for a DUI. His actions were reckless and injurious. The ALJ in this matter significantly deviated from the disciplinary guidelines in recommending a public reprimand for this matter. I determined as a result of Dr. Clark Smith's testimony that licensee was not a substance abusing licensee and as a result recommended respondents probationary period be reduced from five years, which is a minimum to three years. The board must impose discipline of three years probation with biological fluid testing, respondent abstain from use of alcohol and controlled substance, complete a professionalism program in ethics, and undergo a psychiatric evaluation and psychotherapy. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. All right, we will entertain any questions from any of the board members. Dr. Hawkins. May I speak, Lubiana? You may. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're aware of the uh, Soberlink testing, um, Dr. Doerr. Was there ever any biological fluid testing offered or completed uh, by a wellness committee or any other entity after 2018 prior to Soberlink? No, there wasn't. It was never recommended. Not, not offered? Not offered or even mentioned. Okay, thank you. Hey, any Hi, good morning, um, Dr. Dubois. Um, my question is that uh, your counsel mentioned that you've been sober since 2018. And in the record, I read that you were explaining some physical uh, wellness feelings and new ways of seeing the world. Can you, can you explain to us, just tell it in your own words, um, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Like the wellness sense you how I've been feeling well since the event. Um, since you stopped drinking, you explained all these benefits since you stopped drinking in your thinking and how you see the, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. Mm -hmm. And I, I was intrigued by that. So can you tell the board more about that? Right. So I've always been very active, but now I have a, a big commitment to uh math mountain biking, I go road biking, I do yoga, I go surfing. Um, I'm active pretty much every single day of my life. I get out and do some sort of activity, um, which has been something that I, I was active before, but now I'm much more active. Um, that's been kind of a, you know, a big part of my life since then. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I have a question here. Please thank proceed. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question was, with respect to the sober link, uh, is that still being used to date? And I was also curious if what you what you were doing, if any therapy or coursework currently. Um, so I, I'm no, no longer using the sober like device, but I am still sober. I didn't feel that I needed that device to, you know, keep me accountable. I feel like I can hold myself accountable. Um, as far as therapy, I haven't done undergoing any uh, specific uh, therapy. Um, my girlfriend is a psychiatric social worker, so I probably have a, a full time therapist there, um, you know, to help help me get through all these uh, all these things, but. That's it. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lubiano. Anyone else on the board have any questions? I had a quick clarifying question. And the Absolutely. Sober, 
the this the soap link how long were you uh on were you using the device because in the record it is mentioned that you use it for a month in june through july and you did like 99 99 tests that were all positive or negative sorry can i respond to that mr Watkins, your honor or would would um you prefer to hear from dr doer Mr. Watkins, who would you like to hear from? Dr. Dubois, please. I don't, I don't recall the exact dates. Uh, that does sound correct. Um, the reason that we started the um, sober link is the administrative judge um, that um, we had our initial hearing with, or may, maybe prior to that was actually the one that recommended it. Um, and right after she recommended it, we, um, I got the device and started using it. I, I would like to make a clarification to that in that Dr. Dewar was advised by Enlo that they didn't believe he needed to have toxicology or ongoing. And so, although he made a, a personal commitment to himself, he was holding himself accountable. When it came clear that there would need to be a demonstration of abstinence, the only thing that was made sense was the Soberlink device to demonstrate. So, in that 44 days, the machine works where it randomly will call a time and you have to blow in. It has a video camera to ensure that it's you and documents. So it's not a way to beat the, the machine. And in that 45 days time, if somebody was actively addicted or actively using, it would be very hard to get a consistent strain of negative tests. So it was a snapshot into time to show that he is maintaining sobriety, but it wasn't required. He did it on his own initiative to demonstrate to both the board and the court that he is abstaining. All right, any further questions? It appears there are no other questions by the panel members. Uh, one last go around. Is there anything else from respondent that he would like to address to the board? No. Okay, thank you, doctor. All right, that concludes the oral arguments in this matter. The record is closed and the case is submitted and we are off the record. Thank you all. Thank you, Your Honor. You're very welcome. And Mr. Eichelraut will likely be taking over here and. Yes, I've gone ahead and. Um... Promoted from the Attorney General Office, um, Mr. Brian Bill. Mr. Bill, are you there? Mr. Bill, you're on mute. If you, there's a, if you come off mute and just let us know if your microphone's working. Sean, why yeah, is uh, Mr. Good morning. Uh, why is Dr. Dewar's uh, video still on? I'll be. Uh, moving them out in just a moment. I'm just trying to expedite getting everyone in here for you guys. Um, and then yes. I also have, for a response, I have Mr. Wittenberg. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I thank you, Mr. Bill. I, I heard you there. Sorry about it. Okay, great. Thank you. On there. Um, and Mr. Wittenberg is, uh, your client with you. Yes, I'm here with Dr. Tim, Tim Hunt. He's in the, uh. Uh, sitting in the conference room with me here. Okay, uh, I believe that would be all parties then. Um, judge, I'll go ahead and do the cleanup from the last one, but you guys can go ahead and get started. Now. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start my video. I just realized it's not on. Um, and I, if I might inquire uh, of of your honor, um, I don't know if this setup is is. Okay with you and with the board um, when 
I speak or when the doctor speaks, I can move the cat. Unfortunately, the setup here in the conference room isn't ideal, but I can move the camera so it's focused specifically on one of us um, if this is insufficient. I'll, I'll leave it to the board as to what their preference is. I don't know if they want to see the doctor close up or if, if that setup is fine with you folks um, kind of far away. It doesn't seem as though the board has any issues with it, but uh, you know, kindly uh, let me know if, if you do have issues. No objection to the current setup. Okay, thank you. Terrific. All right, I just wanted to confirm uh, Mr. Bill with the Attorney General's office. It looks like he's on the line, but I do not. Oh, I see him now. Never mind. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Bill. And of course, Mr. Wittenberg and Dr. Hunt. Okay, we've got everyone here. Madam Court Reporter, all set? Yes, I am, Your Honor. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, we're going to go ahead and get on the record then. And before we do, I just want to make sure no one needs a break or anything like that. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Let's go ahead and get on the record about two minutes early. We are on the record before the Medical Board of California in the matter of the accusation against Timothy James Hunt. This is Medical Board of California case number 800-2018-04-0. And OAH number 2022-010-448. Today is February 9th, 2022, and the time is approximately 9.59 a.m. And this hearing is being conducted by video conference. This is the date, time, and place set for oral argument in the notice of hearing for oral argument. My name is Danette Brown and I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I have been assigned to preside over this hearing. Prior to going on the record, the board members identified themselves and a quorum was established. This time may I take the appearance of, of councils first starting with the Deputy Attorney General, please. Good morning, Your Honor, and members of the board, Deputy Attorney General Brian Bill on behalf of complainant, the executive officer of the board. Good morning to you, Mr. Bill, and for the respondent. Good morning, Your Honor, and good morning, members of the board. I'm Gary Wittenberg of Baranov and Wittenberg, and I'm here representing the respondent, Dr. Timothy Hunt. Good morning to you, Mr. Wittenberg and Dr. Hunt. The Board in this matter has issued an order of non-adoption of a proposed decision by administrative law judge and has decided to determine the matter by itself. The board has invited particular discussion of whether the proposed order should be modified. And with regard to oral arguments today, the following process and time limitations will apply. Respondent will have 15 minutes to make an opening argument. The Deputy Attorney General will then have 15 minutes for a response. Respondent will then have five minutes for a closing argument. And likewise, the Deputy Attorney General will have five minutes for closing arguments. These time limits will be strictly enforced. And the arguments shall be based only on the existing record and shall not exceed the scope of that record, duly admitted evidence. No new evidence will be heard. The panel members may ask questions of the parties to clarify the arguments, but may not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. The administrative law judge and any panel member may ask a party to support the party's oral argument on a matter with a specific citation to the record. 
and at the end of oral arguments by counsel, I will offer respondent an opportunity to address the panel regarding the penalty. If respondent elects to address the panel, I will first place him under oath. After oral argument, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. The parties will not receive a decision today, but will be receiving it in the mail sometime in the future. Please remember that all arguments must be based on the existing record and no new evidence will be heard. And that the board has already had the benefit of reading the briefs. With that, we will commence with oral arguments. Respondent will have 15 minutes. Opening argument, Mr. Wittenberg. Thank you, Your Honor, and good morning to you and, and to the board members uh, and to Mr. Bill as well. Um, uh, and just to let you know, I, I do expect that Dr. Hunt will, uh, does wish to address the board uh, uh, this morning as well. Um, the, the issue before you is whether the disciplinary order proposed by the administrative law judge, the Honorable Joseph Montoya, is sufficient to protect the public. We believe that the record before you demonstrates uh, quite clearly that probation with terms and conditions is absolutely sufficient uh, to protect the public. Dr. Hunt's crime, which is the basis uh, for the discipline, is one involving dishonesty. Uh, he is deeply ashamed and remorseful for his conduct, which occurred eight years ago now, and for which he has paid an enormous personal price. Dr. Hunt has no prior history of professional misconduct and certainly none involving dishonesty. Um, the administrative law judge, Judge Montoya, made a finding uh, following hearing all the evidence that only a trier of fact can make, that both Dr. Hunt and the witnesses who testified on his behalf at the hearing were, quote, credible in their testimony in terms of their demeanor and the content and consistency of their sworn statements. Judge Montoya goes on, they answered, they, each of them answered questions in a straightforward manner with no hint of prevarication. Um, the law requires the board to give great weight to the factual determination made by the trier of fact. Um, the testimony at the hearing included, uh, I'm sorry, the evidence at the hearing included the testimony of three well-respected uh, California physicians, uh, which was all very consistent. In the many years each of these physicians have known Dr. Hunt, none had ever experienced or heard of him being dishonest. Each testified that the conduct was out of character or an aberration. Each testified that Dr. Hunt is a highly skilled, well-trained orthopedic surgeon who cares about his patients. All were shocked to learn of Dr. Hunt's criminal acts. Each testified that Dr. Hunt had exhibited sincere remorse for his acts and notwithstanding the conviction and um, the accusation by the medical board, they all testified that they would not hesitate to refer patients to Dr. Hunt in the future. Uh, one of the witnesses who testified at the hearing was uh, Dr. Brian McGovern, uh, who is the chief of shoulder and elbow surgery at Harvard UCLA Medical Center. He testified that he expressed disbelief to Dr. Hunt when Dr. Hunt told him um, that he was about to be indicted for a crime. Dr. Hunt, I'm sorry, Dr. McGovern testified, I don't believe it. He told Dr. Hunt when told about this, I do not believe it. And Dr. McGovern further testified at the hearing that Dr. Hunt's response to him was, believe it, it happened. I did it. Um, because of this testimony and other evidence on the, in the record, Judge Montoya made a specific finding that Dr. Hunt has taken responsibility for his misconduct and that he did so at an early stage in the process. That he went on to cooperate with the federal prosecutors and that he showed genuine remorse. Um, Dr. Ahmad Hajj, an orthopedic surgeon in Orange County, who has known Dr. Hunt for years, 
and is familiar with his surgical skills and reputation in the community has agreed. Uh, he's aware of, of, of the criminal conviction. He's aware of the um, uh, proceedings uh, before the medical board and Dr. Hodge, a board certified orthopedic surgeon uh, has agreed to bring Dr. Hunt on board into his medical group and provide whatever supervision or monitoring um, that the medical board may require as part of a probationary order. Um, there are several other mitigating factors that exist that indicate that the proposed discipline or at least probation with terms and conditions is appropriate to protect the public. None of Dr. Hunt's criminal acts involve substandard care, um, nor did his misconduct compromise patient care or endanger any patient. The plea agreement, uh, which is exhibit five of the record at page 31, specifically states, quote, these stipulated facts are not meant to indicate that defendant provided any patients with substandard medical care or that any treatment he provided or prescribed was not medically necessary. This was a crime of dishonesty, not a crime in which any patient's health or well-being was ever compromised. Dr. Hunt was sentenced to 24 months, of which he served about 20 months. Um, the penalty for his crime could have been as much as five years in prison, but it was reduced because of his cooperation with the federal authorities and because he took responsibility early on, um, as he also did um, in the medical board case, stipulating to um, all of the facts as we walked into the hearing. Dr. Hunt has paid a heavy price for his misconduct. He lost the family home and their savings. He's been publicly shamed uh, by his community and his colleagues. He voluntarily stepped down from his position as an associate editor of the Journal of Arthroscopy and from his position on the voluntary faculty uh, at the USC Department of Orthopedic Surgery uh, when criminal charges were imminent. And this was after having served 15 years um, uh, teaching residents at, at USC. Dr. Hunt has a lot to offer the public. Before his conviction, Dr. Hunt was a board certified orthopedic surgeon. He completed his medical education and training at prestigious institutions. He completed two fellowships, um, one in orthopedic trauma surgery at the University of Pittsburgh, and then a second fellowship in sports medicine and arthroscopic surgery um, uh, at the University of California at San Diego. He's published in medical journals and presented at national medical conferences, and he's taught residents at, at USC for, for 15 years. Uh, Dr. Hans' indiscretion has cost him dearly, but he has gained insight into his misconduct and poor judgment as his pastor, um, Monsignor Paul Dotson, has stated, uh, and with whom Dr. Hunt has spent time contemplating his poor judgment and, um, and misconduct in the past. Part of the criminal sentence is uh, requires uh, Dr. Hunt to be under three years of supervised probation. A violation of probation, of the criminal probation, would put him back in prison under the plea agreement for five years. After hearing all the evidence, including questioning Dr. Hunt himself, Judge Montoya concluded that Dr. Hunt showed sufficient rehabilitation to justify a five-year probation and six-month suspension, noting that Dr. Hunt had effectively been, has effectively been, um, suspended from the practice of medicine now for two years. Um, Dr. Hunt will be excluded from federal programs for years to come, and he will be heavily scrutinized in order to get back on staff at any hospital. He wishes to re-enter the profession he loves and that he is trained to perform because he has so much to offer his patients. We recognize Dr. Hunt in particular recognizes the enormous responsibility the board has to, above all else, protect the public. 
Dr. Hunt's crime was an act of dishonesty, an act that was out of character for him. As Judge Montoya concluded, quote, Dr. Hunt has shown to his colleagues and during the hearing that he has made progress in attaining the state of mind expected of one who has been rehabilitated. Respondent has already paid a heavy price for his wrongdoing, and the weight of the evidence leads to the conclusion that he will never engage in such dishonesty again. We asked, we asked this honorable board to adopt the discipline proposed by Judge Montoya, or in any event, a probation with, with a suspension and appropriate terms and conditions so that Dr. Hunt may re-enter the profession he remains dedicated to so that he can utilize his skills and benefit the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wittenberg. All right, now we are going to hand it over to Mr. Bill for an, uh, a response to the argument. Mr. Bill. Thank you, Your Honor, and uh, good morning, members of the board. The issue to be decided today is whether the discipline recommended in the proposed decision adequately protects the public in accordance with the board's primary function. I would submit to you that it does not. After an administrative hearing, ALJ Montoya recommended five years of probation, a six-month practice suspension, various practice restrictions, and other standard terms and conditions. And although respondents' actions towards rehabilitation are noteworthy, his efforts only amount to the first step, uh, and he has not shown over an extended period of time that he is sufficiently rehabilitated to resume the practice of medicine. Therefore, it is complainant's position that respondent is not ready to resume his profession as a doctor and his license must be revoked. By way of background, respondent was an active participant in a conspiracy to defraud Medicare and other public health care services payors for approximately five years. Respondent was illegally paid approximately $3.4 million from his participation in the scheme. Uh, the fraud overall to the federal health care program resulted in approximately $16 million uh, illicit, illicitly billed to the state and or federal health care benefits program. Respondent was charged in federal court with 18 counts of fraud and conspiracy related charges. Pursuant to his criminal plea negotiation, respondent entered a plea of guilty to one count of conspiracy and was sentenced to the lowest possible term, uh, which is two years in prison, three years of post-incarceration supervision, uh, forfeiture of $3 million, and other terms and conditions. The board imposed a, uh, an automatic suspension order on February 14, 2020. Uh, this was retroactive to November 12, 2019, that's the date that the respondent was remanded into custody and the respondent's medical license remains suspended to this day. On April 1st, 2020, the board filed an accusation against respondent based upon the conviction and the underlying conduct. The hearing in this matter was held on August 23rd, 2021. Prior to the start of the hearing, respondent stipulated the facts alleged in the accusation which essentially mirrored the language in the federal indictment and the change of plea form. Therefore, the only decision to be determined at hearing was appropriate discipline. <clears throat> at the hearing, Administrative Law Judge Montoya heard the evidence and weighed the aggravating and mitigating circumstances and recommended a penalty lower than the minimum recommended in the board's disciplinary guidelines, which includes seven years of probation, one year of license suspension, and other terms and conditions. Um, in his opening statement, uh, counsel argued that uh, great weight should be given to the findings of fact. Um, I believe that the law states that great weight should be given to findings of credibility uh, made by the ALJ. Uh, but regardless whether great weight be given to the factual findings uh, or credibility, those findings are not binding on the board with respect to the ultimate decision and order imposed. Although respondent correctly points out that patient care is not at issue, I think it's important to note that it is the dishonesty exhibited by his bad acts that is not compatible with the practice of medicine. Here, respondent's 
criminal conviction coupled with the dishonesty inherent in this crime is incompatible with the practice of medicine and that's codified in Business and Professions Code 2234 Subdivision E uh, and it's reaffirmed in Wyndham versus Board of Medical Quality Assurance 1980 104 Cal App 3rd 461 at 470. And California courts have repeatedly determined that one who unlawfully acts in disregard for the property rights of others, whether known or unknown, demonstrates a moral laxity and to some degree a readiness to do evil. That's People versus Rodriguez, 1986, 177 Cal Lap 3rd, 174. In the case Wyndham versus Board of Medical Quality Assurance, the board disciplined a physician on the basis of a conviction for tax evasion. On appeal, the appellate court stated, we find it difficult to compartmentalize dishonesty in such a way that a person who is willing to cheat his government out of taxes may be considered honest in his dealing with patients. Court further stated, intentional dishonesty demonstrates a lack of moral character and satisfies a finding of unfitness to practice medicine. And that's at 104 Cal App at 470. Uh, the same rationale applies here. It is difficult to compartmentalize the dishonesty in such a way that a person uh, who is willing to commit conspiracy um, to defraud healthcare payors out of millions of dollars uh, could be considered honest in his dealing with patients. I would submit to you that the board should consider that the ALJ's proposed decision is inadequate because it does not adequately address the magnitude of wrongdoing here. Respondents, uh, the respondent committed serious dishonesty in connection with healthcare fraud and he represents a danger to the public and must not be allowed to continue to practice medicine. The length of respondents' participation in the conspiracy and the dollar amount of loss attributable to respondents' conduct warrants, rev warrants revocation. As you are aware, the board's primary purpose is to protect the public. Uh, a, as a secondary purpose, the code requires that the board impose discipline with the goal of rehabilitation rather than punishment. However, when the two are incompatible, as they are here, the board must choose public protection and revoke the respondent's license. With respect to this case, the board must weigh the aggravating and mitigating factors and then render a decision regarding the appropriate level of discipline. If, after conducting this analysis, the board cannot harmonize its primary and secondary purpose, the board must render a decision with the sole purpose of public protection. Therefore, if the board concludes that the recommended discipline is inadequate to protect the public, then the board is obligated to impose a higher level of discipline. Finally, I would submit to you that in determining the adequacy of the proposed dis discipline in this case, the board must resolve all doubts in favor of public protection. And based on these factors, I would ask that the board uh, revoke respondents medical license. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Respondent will now have five minutes for a closing argument. Mr. Wittenberg. Thank you, Your Honor. Revocation of Dr. Hunt's license would be a travesty of justice. Dr. Hunt is an ideal candidate for probation. Um, He's taken full and complete responsibility for the misconduct, and he did so five years ago when he voluntarily walked into the U.S. Attorney's Office um, and cooperated. His misconduct occurred eight years ago. Um, as Judge Montoya, Judge Montoya was aware when he issued his proposed discipline um, at uh, to be less than the minimum guidelines, he was aware uh, that he was doing this, and he was also aware of the uh, regulation that he cites in his opinion that the disciplinary guidelines um, uh, 
provide where an ALJ would depart from those guidelines for reasons such as mitigating circumstances, the age of the case, or evidentiary problems, such issues should be identified. And, Don, and, and Judge Montoya goes on to identify those things. Um, the, the, the four witnesses that testified at the hearing were the respondent and three physicians who know Dr. Hunt very well and who are um, reputable members of the medical profession. And Judge Montoya made the finding that each of them were credible. And he made the finding that Dr. Hunt, uh, Dr. Hunt's misconduct occurred eight years ago, eight years have passed, and that he has demonstrated um, remorse. And um, um, Dr. Hunt has been an exemplary citizen up to the moment he got involved with Dr. Bernadette and Mr. Drobot um, back in 2006 or seven. Um, he has extensive training and skills that remain that if that if licensed, he will be able to benefit the public. The chance that he will reoffend is zero. Judge Montoya made the finding and reached the conclusion that, quote, the weight of the evidence leads to the conclusion that Dr. Hunt will never engage in such dishonesty again. And that was based on his assessment of the credibility of Dr. Hunt and of, um, of, of the other witnesses who testified. The consequence to Dr. Hunt of reoffending would be draconian. He would go back to prison for five years. He'd likely lose his family um, and the colleagues that have stood by him during this period of time. He exercised poor judgment eight years ago. Um, However, the record before you demonstrates that Dr. Hunt is worthy of probation and that he'd be an ideal probationer and that the public would be sufficiently protected uh, with him on probation. Judge Montoya felt so strongly that Dr. Hunt is appropriate for probation, he justified a penalty below the minimum recommended in the guidelines. And as California law states, the object of discipline, as Mr. Phil mentioned, is not to punish, but to protect the public and on this record, the public would be protected with a probationary order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wittenberg. All right, uh, the Deputy Attorney General will have five minutes for closing argument. Mr. Bill. Thank you. Uh, respondents rehabilitation efforts simply have not outweighed the scale of fraud committed over the course of five years. Acceptance of responsibility is a necessary prerequisite to establishing rehabilitation, and that was stated in the case in the matter of Brown, 1993 to Cal State Bar Court Reporter 309. Rehabilitation is a state of mind, and the law looks with favor upon rewarding the opportunity to serve one who's achieved reformation and regeneration. That was stated in Pacheco versus State Bar. 1987, 43, uh, Cal 3rd, 1041. However, uh, fully acknowledging the wrongfulness of past actions is an essential step towards rehabilitation, but it is just a first step. And that's side versus committee of uh, bar examiners, 1989, 49, Cal 3rd, 933. And the mere expression of remorse does not demonstrate rehabilitation, a truer indication of rehabilitation will be presented if a petitioner, or in this case a respondent, can demonstrate by sustained conduct over an extended period of time that he or she is rehabilitated and fit to practice. That's in Ray Mena, 1995, 11 Cal 4th, 975. And I would submit to you that based upon the record, uh, at this point, respondent has not shown over an extended period of time that he has sufficiently rehabilitated uh, to warrant a return to practice of medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bill. All right, now we will entertain questions from the board. And we you know what I'm going to do uh, that I didn't do in the prior hearing. I'm just going to go ahead 
and poll the panel A members going down the list to see if they have any questions, starting with Chair Lubiano. Madam, do you have any questions for respondent? Your Honor, I apologize for the interruption. Dr. Um, Hunt would like to address the panel. Would you like that to occur now or after questioning? Uh, how about um, perhaps uh, have the board at, uh, ask questions and then um, respondent can go ahead and, and address the panel and maybe, you know, if he, there were questions that uh, the board members asked that he would like to address during that time, that would be in addition to the responses that he will give to the panel members. Um, maybe that would be the logical way to go. So questions by the board then respondent addressing the panel. Thank you, Judge Brown. I, I had one one question for Dr. Hunt, and and I was curious about your. I, I saw that you had taken some ethics coursework or a significant amount, and I was curious about your current rehabilitation efforts, if any, what those are. Good morning. I believe you're referencing the PBI course that I took on ethics and professionalism, and that was a 22 hour course over the weekend. Uh, which was very helpful. Um, and my ongoing rehabilitation really involves preparing myself mentally to try to get back to practice if that's allowed by you and discussing with colleagues and uh, friends steps to get ready to do that. And I, if I might add, um, as I mentioned in, in my statement, Dr. Uh, Hunt has an ongoing relationship with his pastor that he sees on a weekly basis, and uh, he may want to address that as well uh, as as part of his um, ongoing uh, rehabilitation. Yes, I <clears throat> do see Monsignor Dotson on a weekly basis. If he's not a celebrant, he's usually greeting the congregants and he knows my family very well. He knows all my kids. Um, so he knows what they've been through and he's always asked me how things are going personally with them and very interested in and in hoping that, that I'm rehabilitated enough to, to get back into practice, which he's praying for and hoping like I am. Thank you for that. No further questions from me. Your Honor, I yes, apologize sir. for interrupting, but has the has the respondent been sworn in? I don't oh recall. Thank you. Appreciate that. My plan was to do it after the board questions, but thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Miss Mr. Hunt, if you could or Dr. Hunt, could you kindly raise your right hand? Thank you again for the reminder. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, sir. All right, now we can uh, commence with the questions. And uh, with your prior response, um, you did testify or you did respond that that was the truth, the whole the truth and nothing but the truth. Is that correct, Dr. Hunt? Yes, Your Honor. Is it wrong? Okay. Is that wrong? I, I, I just had a, I had, a, I had a request. Is there a way for us to see a, a, a you know, a more of a close-up. I can't really see the uh, respondent. In, in, you know, a way for us to actually make a better presentation in front of the camera. Yes, if you can excuse my COVID haircut, give me a moment to move the camera. I'd be happy to, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No, no, stay there. I'll get it. Is that better, sir? 
Sorry, we lost your audio. It's a little bit better. Talk into the thing. Okay, yeah. Judge Brown, I, I have a question for Dr. Hunt. Dr. Hunt, when was the last time you saw patients? Uh, that was in 2018. Uh, can you be a little more specific? Uh, the month at least? Uh, sure, that would have been. I want to say, like, November in about that range late into 2018. I can't give you an exact date. I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's fine. Thank you. Okay, going down the list, vice chair, Dr. Hawkins, any questions? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just briefly. Um, uh, we're aware one cannot go back in time. None of us can. One of the questions I have is, is why believable now? Yes, we understand. I understand rather the high bar that you have, but I'm not sure why now. We always grapple with giving credit for individuals who, once they're disciplined or under uh, investigation, change. Their behavior, it's expected that they will do that. Uh, it's, you know, but why would anyone believe that you really do, in your words, are a changed person and would respect the license that you are given in terms of the ability to take care of patients who trust and trust their lives with you? Yes, um, I have always thought of myself as being an honest, straightforward person. That's why this is particularly difficult. Um, I've my crime to put my family, uh, friends, uh, colleagues, hospitals, affiliations all in a bad light because of me. And it's been particularly difficult uh, on my wife. Um, she's been at times ostracized, uh, feeling a, a lot of guilt and shame, and it's really all my fault. Uh, she didn't do anything. I am, have no one else to blame but myself, and I got what I deserve, but unfortunately, um, she's still feeling a lot of uh, stress from this and, and difficulties, and I, I'm lucky I'm still married, honestly. Um, there's been financial difficulties along the way, and this has affected my children as well on having to explain their father's illegal activities, their friends. So it, it, it's to those kind of people, and I've had colleagues stick with me as can be seen in the record and very supportive and friends that I, I am so ashamed of my activity that there's no way that I would allow myself to do something dishonest like this again. Um, I, I wouldn't want to put them through the pain. Um, I I made reference to that PBI class, and um, you know I learned hot button, hot ethics issues, and that seems to be for my personality type, where I'm sort of a okay, go get it uh, kind of a person. That I've learned a lot and some discernment and and insight about how to slow down and think things over and get consultations. So between not wanting to let my to put everybody through this misery again, which is all me, not them. They don't deserve it. And the, the lessons that I've learned, I, I feel that I'm a different person than I was before. And I, I, I feel that the, the probation in my case would protect the public because I just would never do it again. I, um, you know, I like to think I was a good orthopedic surgeon when I was working and uh, I have a lot of training and skills and I, I really, uh, miss being with patients and helping them. That's really what I like to think I'm about. And I'd like to be a good guy in society again, not, not, you know, be considered a bad guy. And, and I'm willing to do anything it takes to get back to there. And I'm willing to uh, comply with any condition that, that you all may give me for probation, because I'm going to have a very difficult time getting back. Um, it's not, just the medical board. I've you know on the OIG exclusion list, so that's seven years right there of no federally or state funded patients. Um, banned from workers' compensation, it appears. So I'm going to have a long, hard, tough road back. And luckily, Dr. Hodge, as you know, 
would like to employ them if possible. And I may end up having to, you know, and I'll be glad to take it to see non federal or state funded HMO patients and, and, and do what I can to try and be an orthopedic surgeon. I may not be able to, I may have to, if you allow me. Uh, to do other non non orthopedic roles for a physician and, but I'm, I'm willing to do that, but I. To get back to what I'm sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but. I, I just couldn't do that to everybody involved again. So I think I'm a different person and I've learned and, and that's the best I can tell you about how that's not going to happen again. Thank you. All right, we'll circle back to Dr. Nana Dev. Any other questions? No, thank you, Judge Brown. Okay, and board member Ryu. You're on mute. David, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, Judge. Um, I'll rephrase again. Uh, it was mentioned several times. I, I, am I off mute now? I want to make sure. Hello? We can hear you. Yes, you you're hear? off mute. All right, just wanted to make sure first. Uh, well, it was mentioned several times that um, patient care was never affected and it was just a matter of dishonesty. Um, I was at wondering if Mr. Hunt could explain what you were dishonest about. Well, in doing this crime, you've taken away the patient's ability to participate in their care. You've limited where they're going. You're dictating their care. You're not letting them participate. So you've taken away what the federal government called honest services. And that's, that's really the harm to the patient, even though the, the patient care itself and the testing was appropriate, that's the harm to the patient. Um, thank you for your honesty there. Um, you know, then uh, it's kind of what um, one of the, one of my colleagues asked, you know, what assurances could you give me um, if that if I went to you, that you would give the right diagnosis and the right referral, especially with the potential need um, for you to make up for lost earning power in the past several years? Well, I, again, I, I, I consider my activity or my crime aberrant and I, I loathe that I did it. And I wish like it was said earlier that I could go back and change it. I can't. I like to, I, I do put the patients first in terms of trying to help them with their diagnosis and help them with their treatment. And I, I think you would see that many, many of my colleagues would agree that you could trust me to do that. I am just trying to get back in. I'm not trying to make up any monetary um, uh, reasons. That's that, that I'm, a, I'm a change man and I would never do that again and put people through that. So I. I, I believe I would treat you honestly and fairly and give you the best of my skills. Thank you. No other questions. Thank you, board member Ryu. Moving on to board member Watkins. Any questions? Yes, I've just got a few questions. So just clarifying again. Um, so you were practicing from the period that this occurred was 2008 to 2013. And then you continue to practice through to 2018. Then the legal uh, issues started. Is that correct? Yeah, there was quite a bit of lag time, lag time from the end of the crime to when it was actually prosecuted. And there was a statute of limitations approaching, but still the crimes were done during that time frame that you mentioned. But you continued to practice in, in the set. Correct, but not affiliated with Pacific Hospital and, and any of that. I started a new practice. So my, my, my second question is then in when this conviction occurred, part of your, you know, settlement arrangement was that you would serve two years and you ended up serving seven and a half months in prison and 13 months under home arrest. Is that correct? That is correct. With federal crimes, you're given a 15% off the top, assuming a good behavior, which is what I did. So that you back the 24 months up 15%, and that's how you reach that 20 plus months. 
um, the reason I was sent to home confinement so early was COVID. Um, it was starting to come into the prison systems, and because I was low risk, uh, I met their metrics for going to home confinement early. And another clarifying question: the record was not clear on this, and whether you made the repayment of the three million as part of that settlement agreement. I haven't started any significant payment of that yet at all. Explain. Um, so the forfeiture um, is is part of the record, as you can see. Um, it the, the ability of the federal government to collect it appears to start when you reach probation, which I just started in July. Um, my I have a, a separate attorney that's working with the. Um, uh, Office of Financial Litigation uh, to see when I'm supposed to start to participate in paying. My, I don't have a lot of assets right now, to be honest, but we're cooperating with them and trying to investigate when that begins. And my final question is, there's a theme, uh, you know, in the record you said when they when you were asked, how do you feel about the fact that you have a convict, you are a convicted felon? And you reply, you know, it's just not me. And that was echoed with uh, throughout all the other witnesses, the other three doctors that that ended up testifying on your behalf at hearing, all said that it was out of character, that it was out of character. Here's my question. While these crimes were being committed, they knew you and they were surprised and they speak to the surprise of it. So you presented at the time yourself as very honest and they got surprised. Today, we are questioning because the basis of all of this is dishonesty, is your degree of honesty right now. Because you, you have very affirmative statements. You says, I will never do this again. This will never happen again. And can you explain to me what gives you that confidence? Because, because all of this was present in 2005 to 2008, once you became aware, 2008 to 2013, once you became aware that, you know, what you were, what you were doing is going to probably get you in prison. Right. I, when that did become apparent to me, I no longer practice with Pacific Hospital or and started my own practice and didn't have any illegal activity at all. Um, you know, in terms of what I can tell you to uh, let you know that I'm an honest person and, you know, during the time I, I started, um, Allied Medical Group, which is the basis for this. Um, I was starting a new company and it was a difficult time and I'm not making any excuses. And, and I was told along the way that, hey, this is legal, but I should have seen that it wasn't. And I, I you know, I've, I've talked about this in the record and instead I, I pushed through. Um, I have so much shame from that. And I, when it was clear to me after meeting with the the federal authorities, you know, I had thought, well, they, they said it's okay. It, it, it wasn't okay. It fell on me to do the right thing. And I didn't, and I've had shame since that point that I've not participated in anything illegal after that time. I would never do it again because it, I, I just, again, I couldn't put, put my family and friends through it again, nor would I want to go through it again. And I'm trying to get back to being a reputable, respected physician as I once was. Just clarifying, this all began because of financial difficulties. And today, again, we are again in financial difficulty, just based on, you know, what you're telling us. So in essence, you know, before and now in between a lot happened. So to explain to me, to, uh, to, to us that what you you said you had the 22 hour course you have a lot of introspection give us an idea about what you've learned from that experience this is my final question what you've learned from that experience when you look back the financial difficulty and 
all the money that was made and then all the money that was lost. What did you learn? Uh, would I learn about the money? I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question fully. How you would navigate this differently? You know, when you when you do introspection and you look back, you say, oh, I would do that differently. I would do this differently. I just would like to know from you what you would have, if I put you back in 2008, what you would do differently, being oh. in financial difficulty at that time. That's a good question because I've thought about that a million times. Um, after my father died and when I was trying to start a new company to allow me, to, me and the other doctors to see the, the patients, I got so caught up in that and just was willing to blow through any kind of stop signs because I need to get going. I felt a rush that the PBI class and all this time that I've had for introspection, I should have slowed it down and said, wait, I have other options. I don't have to keep this going. I can arrange for patient follow up for all of these patients to make sure they're taken care of. You know, I, I have other options, but instead when Dr. Bernadette first said, hey, I can give you a loan. And as things started to get worse and, and like, hey, I don't understand it. Well, I'm just going to keep going. The lawyer said it's OK. I should have stopped right at the beginning, but I kept going and I, and I wish I could go back in time. That's what I would have done. I would have just stopped it right there. You know, I had other options, but I, I went in the wrong direction and I profoundly regret it. If, if I can add um, something to put, put things into context a little bit, Your Honor, is that okay? Yes, please. Um, so it's laid out in my brief fairly extensively in, 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 in the record in terms of Dr. Hunt's testimony. Um, but what Dr. Hunt is referring to is this scenario where um, he grew up as a kid in his father's practice, and it was always the plan that he was going to take over his dad's practice. And of course, he was fortunate enough to be smart enough to and have the wherewithal to go to law uh, medical school and and did very well. And and so uh, after he completed his second fellowship, he rather than stay in San Diego and take advantage of the opportunities there, he returned to the South Bay to his his community. And and went into practice with his father, and uh, he his father was expected to retire shortly, and he was going to take over and grow the practice and move it in a different dire direction. Um, but then things suddenly changed when uh, uh, Dr. Hunt's father's fourth wife, um, Dr. Hunt's father, I'm sorry unexpectedly decided he was going to leave the practice and all of its assets to the fourth wife um, and not Dr. Hunt. And that's what put Dr. Hunt in this position of, oh my gosh, I've got patients, I've got colleagues who have, who've worked in the clinic for all these times, I've got an office manager and staff that I've known for decades, you know, what am I going to do with these? And I think what Dr. Hunt was speaking to was at that time, in that in that period of desperation, when Dr. Bernadette approached him and said, "Hey, I'll give you a loan. Let's keep the doors open," um, that was the big mistake. Was stepping into that into that quagmire and accepting that loan um, and not stopping and getting the appropriate consultation at that point. Um, and then it snowballed because then Dr. Bernadette pulled the rug out and said, I'm not giving you the second installment. And so now the practice was going to be shuttered again. Um, and that's when Dr. Bernadette brought Mr. Drobot into the picture and they came up with this, you know, with this scheme that Dr. Hunt, you know, jumped into and as he testified, you know, went into with blinders on. So, you know, when he speaks of the PBI course, and when he speaks of Doctor, uh, uh, his time with, with, with his pastor, um, and and uh, uh, gaining insight and 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 giving things a lot of thought, um, I, I think that's what the context is, and that's what the picture is. If that 
if that's at all helpful. That's thank you for explaining it very well. All right, uh, it doesn't appear there. I have a quick question for the AG, uh, Mr. Bill. Um, earlier, uh, Mr. Hum was talking about some restrictions that he has to go under irrespective. I mean, if he gets reinstated um, because of his criminal conviction, because of not being able to do Medi-Cal. I mean, can you uh, confirm that or explain that? Um, well, I think you're referring to the terms and conditions um, imposed by the, the criminal conviction. Um, and I believe, uh, I believe one of the terms of probation um, is a, uh, I don't know if it's an agreement or if it's an order to um, uh, be excluded from billing uh, public health care uh, pay or, or services rendered. Um, I believe that that is um, documented in the record. Um, if you want me to go through it and provide a pinpoint citation, I can do that. It would take me a few minutes, though. If you just tell me what, um, I don't recall seeing it. If you just tell me what page it was, I could just take a look at it myself. Once again, uh, yeah. give me a few minutes here. Don't know exactly where it was. Um, I think so. May I add something, Your Honor? It is who is that speaking? It's Dr. Hunt. May I, may I add something, Your Honor? Uh, sure. While they're walking. So the Office of Inspector General conducted their own investigation and I have a separate attorney for that that has dealt with them and their final determination is I'm barred for seven years before I can reapply. That's separate from the federal court. Now there is a citation in here in the judgment and uh, from judge state and the federal the criminal attorney, but the office of inspector general is a separate thing apart from that, if you will. All right, thank and, you. Uh, with re I'm sorry, with respect to, uh, the. Plea negotiation, um, and the sentence imposed by the, the federal court, I believe that. Uh, on page 152 of the uh, administrative record, paragraph four, I believe that that um, encompasses an exclusion from federally funded, participating in federal, federally funded healthcare systems. Seven years, I'm assuming? That, I, I can't confirm that. Um, I, I, I don't know at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, let's round out the questioning, uh, board member, Dr. Yip, any questions? Uh, I can most of my answer. So the last question, uh, doctor, which hospital did you practice after Pacific, uh, hospital and how long did you practice? Like two more years? Uh, about two and a half, three years, yeah. And uh, there was no uh, malpractice lawsuit as uh, from that period of uh, practice. That's correct, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Yip. All right, um, we are going over our time. We were supposed to go to, into closed session at ten fifty, so we're running about six minutes late. Uh, but I did want to ask. Dr. Hunt, um, is there anything else that you would like to say to the board? No, Your Honor, I, I believe I covered everything that I, I wanted to address. Thank you. All right, very good. And Your Honor, just to well, be- it appears that- I'm sorry, Your Honor, just to be clear, I think I, I, I thought I heard Mr. Bill reference to a different page number. 
Um, I see what he's referring to on page 149 of the of the record um, paragraph four that defendant shall not be employed by or otherwise participate in any federally funded or state funded health insurance or entitlement programs. I see it on page 149. I think he may have said a different page number. Okay, so Mr. Ryu, are you squared away with the, the reference there? Thank you. Okay, very good. All right, that concludes the arguments in this matter. The record is closed, the case is submitted, and we are off the record. The panel will be deliberating in closed session. And so I'll hand it over to Mr. Michael Kraut for the IT machinations. Thank you, Judge Brown. Um, all the panel members and Judge Brown yourself too, you should have a separate link for a closed session meeting that is now open. You guys can hop over and join that. I would caution you to get any information you need from the court reporter though or anything, because the court reporter will not be moving over into that session. Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Coffey, yeah. um, I've got your CSR number, so just number of pages and the time. Okay. Uh, page count is five pages, and uh, the end time is uh, ten fifty eight. Terrific! Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, so you just, 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 just want to be absolutely clear: you don't need me anymore, correct? For the closed session, or should I stay on when you return? Or That is correct. Uh, you are not needed for the closed session and you are basically uh, dismissed from the, the hearings this morning. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. For all the public bye -bye. attendees that we will be keeping this meeting open for later adjournment. Uh, it will just be closed session until that time though, um, but you're more than welcome to wait in this meeting for when the meeting is actually adjourned later on this afternoon. If I could ask uh, Judge Brown and all the panel members and Andrea, please, uh, you know, exit now and go ahead and join the closed session deliberations meeting, and I will see you over there. Viviana, you want to adjourn the meeting? Hello there. Nope. We're back to the open session. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So I'm here to call for adjournment. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.